I think it makes more sense to look at this question through a screencast rather than just making notes uh, to you, simply because there's a fair bit of discussion in this. And it's question number two, uh, and it reads, A car is driving along different sections of a road with the same constant speed as illustrated in the diagrams below. Consider those curved surfaces A and C are a section of a circle and the diameters for each curve are the same. So when we look at A and C, we're assuming the same diameter, or in other words, the same radius. Discuss which car is exerting the most and which car is exerting the least force on the surface of the road with the support of some algebraic relationships. Okay, before I even get into that, I want to discuss about the uh, concept of the car exerting a force on the road. We understand from Newton's third law that that would be a reaction force to the normal force of the road on the car, the, the road pushing up on the car effectively. So in this question, we're going to have a look at the normal force at all times in, in all three situations. The normal force of the road on the car will tell us exactly the value of the force of the car on the road. And in fact, we're not even after the value. We're just trying to establish which one is the highest and which one is the lowest. Okay, before we get started, I want to highlight a couple of things about circular motion that I think we have to pay attention to at all times when we're having this discussion. So our key points to remember go as follows. We have to recognize that because velocity is a vector quantity, acceleration, which is the rate of change of velocity, will occur when there is a change in the magnitude or the direction of the velocity. So maintaining a constant speed through a turn still represents an acceleration because of the change in direction. You would know this when you're a passenger in a car, you go around a turn, you feel the pushing of the side of the car, you feel pressure on your side, on the side opposite to the direction that you're turning, you can feel that pressure um, pushing you around the turn, essentially steering you away from your path, which is straight ahead, which inertia wants you to continue with, um, into a curved path. And so there is definitely a change in direction and you can feel it, you can feel that acceleration and we call that centripetal acceleration. Now, what we need to know about centripetal acceleration is naturally it has to be the result of a force, what we would call centripetal force, simply because accelerations are always the evidence of a net force. In the case of centripetal force, it's always directed toward the center of the circle or the curved path that you're traveling around, always directed towards the center. And that's very important to us in our analysis of these three roads. And finally, I think this one is most important. Centripetal force is the net force acting on an object traveling in a circular path at a constant velocity. It's not like it's a force that exists on its own. It's the vector sum of all the forces acting at once. So it, it's a little bit unlike gravity, where gravity is always acting on you. Centripetal force is not always acting on you. It, it's the sum of all the forces that cause you to travel in a circular path, or cause an object to travel in a circular path. Okay, with those things in mind, let's take a look at the three situations that we're talking about. And we're after that normal force. Remember, the normal force of the road will give us the reaction force of the vehicle. Okay, so here we go. Here are the three situations. Now I'm actually going to do these a little bit out of order. I'm going to do the two curved paths first and finish with the last straight level path. Okay, in our first uh, situation, I'm dealing with the car going over top of the hill, going over the top of a crest. In this situation, I've got three forces indicated on my diagram. I've got my gravi gravitational force pulling down on the vehicle. That never changes. That's the same in all three of our situations. I've got the normal force of the road pushing up on the vehicle. That will change. And I've got a centripetal force. And we have to remind ourselves that that centripetal force is the net force. And so those three forces are represented in my free body diagram. When I write my vector equation, I say, I say, that the centripetal force is equal to the sum of the normal force and the gravitational force. Now, as a convention, a very common thing to do in physics, we're going to assign the direction up as positive. That will allow me to drop the vector symbols on top of all the forces and assign negatives and positives according to the direction they're pointing. So I would write negative FC equals FN 
minus fg. Now remember, I'm after that fn, so I rearrange that equation, and I have negative fc plus fg equals fn. Now the vector equivalent of that would be the magnitude of vector fn, or the magnitude of the normal force is equivalent to the magnitude of the gravitational force subtract the magnitude of the centripetal force. Or in other words, the magnitude of the normal force is simply the difference in the magnitudes of the force of gravity and the centripetal force. Now that's going to be really important in the next part because our gravitational force and our centripetal force do not change in magnitude anyway from the top of the hill and bottom of the valley situation. In a nutshell, I'm essentially saying that the magnitude of the reaction force of the car on the road is also simply the difference between Fg and Fc. Okay, moving on. The second scenario, at the bottom of the valley, the only difference in terms of the forces and how they're directed is that the centripetal force is directed up. As I wrote in my previous solution, I said that the centripetal force is always directed towards the center of the radius of curvature, or towards the center of the circle. So in this situation, Fc is now pointed upward. Remember, it is a net force. So that's going to drive my normal force to be a larger value because Fc is going to be the vector sum of Fn and Fg. So I've written that. Vector Fc equals vector Fn plus vector Fg. Using that same sign convention, I have that Fc is equal to Fn minus Fg. That's because Fc and Fn are both pointed up. They're both positive. And with Fg pointed down, that's negative. So now we have when we rearrange that equation, Fn is equivalent to Fc plus Fg, or Fc plus Fg is equal to Fn. And if I throw my vectors back in, which is the way I like to write it, um, I would write that the magnitude of vector Fn is equal to the magnitude of vector Fg plus the magnitude of vector Fc. Or in other words, I'm saying that the magnitude of the normal force is now the sum of the magnitudes of Fg and Fc. In the previous example, it was the difference. Now it's the sum. So once again, the reaction force of the car on the road must also be the sum of Fg and Fc. And as a result, this has to be greater than the previous example. In the previous example, we were looking at the difference between Fg and Fc, not the sum. And then our final situation is actually really easy. Let's take a look at it. With the flat road and the car traveling at a constant velocity, we have no uh, change in speed. We have no change in direction. And so as a result, we have zero acceleration, or F net must be equal to zero. So our vector equation, which is just Fn plus Fg, or vector Fn plus vector Fg equals the zero vector, we discover that vector Fn is equivalent to the negative of vector Fg, or in terms of magnitudes, the magnitude of vector Fn is equal to the magnitude of vector Fg. So because there's no acceleration, the magnitudes of Fn and Fg are the equal, and therefore the reaction force of the car on the road is the magnitude of vector Fg. And as a result, if we were to rank these now, this value is somewhere between the two previous values. So if we go back to the original question, when we look from left to right, our situation is the greatest, the greatest force will occur, uh, the greatest force of the vehicle on the road will occur in situation C, the least will occur in situation A, and the value in between will be situation B. I hope that makes that a little more clear for you.